it's really sad, and I really thank you for doing all this research and, and bringing this forward because they're high visibility. They're celebrity. A lot of young people follow them religiously and very closely, and um, everybody knows who they are. So when we start looking around uh, the news now, everyone listening tonight or, or in the future to this talk, will uh, begin to notice themselves and educate themselves on what's really happening. Until they are informed, they're unaware. It just passes by. But, I mean, even you surprised me with all these in, these cases that you've mentioned. It's great, really great uh, topic. Thank you. Well, we, we have some more. Um, we're, we're getting more into thyroid cancer, cancer and adrenal problems now. And these are all recent cases. And I started collecting these about a year ago, but I have seen a huge jump in the number of these illnesses being reported. It's um, going to escalate every day, every week, every month, every year. Case number four is Brooke Burke. She's 41. She's an American actress, dancer, model, and television personality. Uh, she's been on Dancing with the Stars, hosted the annual Golden Globe Awards, uh, the pre-show for that. She also hosted in 2011, 2012, and 2013 the Miss America pageant. She does a lot of flying. And in November, she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. This article appeared on Fox News. December 17th of 2012, and from the article it said, although no one wants a diagnosis of cancer, the good news is that thyroid cancer is one of the most treatable types, says Dr. John Yim, professor of surgery at City of Hope National Medical Center. More and more people around the world are being diagnosed with cancer of the thyroid, a butterfly-shaped gland in the neck, and no one is sure why. Well, one of the reasons why there's such a large increase is that on March um, 17th, which is two days before the Fukushima, first clouds of Fukushima radiation reached the west coast of North America, the U.S. Surgeon General um, had sent out a notice to every county, the public health department in every county in the United States, uh, warning the public health departments to notify all medical doctors in those counties, in their county, that um, they should not uh, provide iodine or encourage patients to take iodine, uh, patients who are concerned about the Fukushima radiation. And uh, the, the iodine disappeared from uh, pharmacies, the doctors would not provide it for their patients. They told them not to worry about it. I'm sure some good doctors who were concerned about their patients made uh, accommodated them. But boy, that's the first thing I ran out and got as soon as uh, those as soon as I knew there was a Fukushima problem, because that stuff was over here. Um, let's see, in uh, Seven days, eight days. It travels pretty fast. And uh, a woman sent me two letters from two doctors in two different counties, Sonoma County, north of San Francisco, and uh, the county where, where Stanford is. Um, I've forgotten what county that is. But um, those, those letters were sent to those doctors. I read them. And I was really shocked. And what it said in the letters is that, um, oh, they shouldn't take iodine uh, because it, it might damage their heart or it might make them sick or whatever. Well, I'm telling you, not taking it is what is making them sick. So obviously, the Surgeon General uh, was ordered to do that and to deprive the entire American population of any way to protect their thyroids and their children. Uh, it was so crazy. It's so deliberate. It's so obvious. It's undeniable. In a recent study from Joseph Mangano and Jeanette Sherman 
Hypothyroid cases in five states on the Pacific Ocean, Alaska, California, Hawaii, Oregon, and Washington increased by 28% from March 17th to June 30th, 2011. They reported that large amounts of fallout disseminated worldwide from the meltdowns in four reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi plant, including radioiodine isotopes. Just days after the meltdowns, iodine-131 concentrations in U.S. precipitation was measured up to 211 times above normal. It was horrendous. The highest levels and airborne gross beta were documented in the five U.S. states on the Pacific Ocean, and that's where we're seeing this rise. Now, this data only goes through to June 30th of 2011. Yeah, they um, they quit reporting and they quit making the uh, information available to the public. Case case number five is Jessica Alba. She's 31. She recently revealed how she was rushed to the hospital after fearing that she was having a stroke. The Fantastic Four actress, 31, said she was terrified after losing feeling in her hand and suffering a headache and heart palpitations. The mother of two was at home with husband Cash Warren when the drama unfolded. She explained during an appearance on the Jimmy Fallon live show, Basically, I thought I was having a stroke. I really, really thought I was. My whole arm went numb. I got cold sensations in the back of my neck to the front, and I couldn't move my face. She also said she had heart palpitations. She eventually went to the hospital for an MRI, but the test revealed that she was only suffering from carpal tunnel syndrome. This appeared in the Daily Mail as well. I'm not aware that carpal tunnel syndrome causes heart palpitations and you not being able to move your face. It's It's a... It's disinformation. Um, She has neuromuscular damage, and she has cardiac damage. Uh, Cesium uh, has had a terrible impact all over the world because I've been monitoring cardiac arrest, heart attacks, and uh, death from heart attacks in athletes. Uh, there were a number of big um, running races in in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and in Texas uh, in the summer after the Fukushima disaster. And uh, some of the athletes uh, just collapsed and, had from, and died from heart attacks in the middle of the race. And some of them collapsed with cardiac arrest and cardiac arrest and were taken to hospitals. Well, you can imagine that it might happen once in a blue moon in a someone under 30, but when you have five or ten athletes in the same race and they're all under 30 having heart attacks and cardiac arrest and all these unexplained uh, problems due, due to heart damage, then you have to kind of start to question what, you know, is that the cesium? Well, yes, it is. And Dr. Chris Busby did a very, very good video clip on cesium and uh, the damage it does to the heart muscle. And I'm talking about very, very small amounts. Um, And, oh, it's just so sad. It's really sad. Um, I'm sorry. I... It just upsets me. Well, there's been a couple cases from um, television personalities. I know what I wanted to say. Let me just finish. Um, There were uh, soccer and football matches in England and Italy where athletes um, had cardiac arrest. Uh, Another athlete in the same football club in England um, one week, the one of their top runners um, ended up with cardiac arrest in the hospital. I think he survived. Uh, and another player in the on the same team three days later announced he was at the game, but he wasn't playing. And he announced to the media that he just found out that morning that he had acute leukemia. 
Um, horse races are dropping dead in races uh, in 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 high numbers. Uh, it's uh, and now I'm seeing all kinds of animals, little puppies with hair lips and cleft palates and um, just. Dis- uh, deformed legs and or born with no legs or oh my god it's um, it's just turning into a medical nightmare case number six is Chantel Houghton she's 29 she's an English glamour model and television personality she also said that she thought she had had a stroke went to the hospital it turned out that it was the flu Case number seven, Gwyneth Paltrow, who's 41. She's an American actress. She described recently what appears to have been a miscarriage of her third child and reveals more details about an unrelated health scare. She almost died from that miscarriage. Well, this event that happened in late spring of 2011, she said, and after what we just read about Jessica Alba, uh, this is, is really... A very strange coincidence. She lost control of her right hand. She suffered a blinding pain in her head that was so extreme she thought she was having a stroke. The incident occurred while she was in the garden of her home in North London. She said she underwent a series of tests that revealed she was a mess. She was vitamin D deficient. She had anemia. She had thyroid issues. Her liver was congested. She had hormonal imbalances and a benign tumor on her ovary that had to be removed. Sounds like she she got nuked. It sounds like she got nuked, and what is so strange is she actually wrote in her newsletter about how to avoid radiation in April of 2011. She said in her newsletter she had some super helpful advice on protecting yourself from radiation. Among the tips from doctors that she knows was limit exposure, move away from from an exposure area, have other sources of food and water, drink miso soup, and the most helpful advice of all is just stop thinking so much about it. Worried about the nuclear radiation from the Fukushima reactor meltdowns? Worrying does you no good. It impairs your immune system, tips your brain out of balance, and distracts you from dealing with real life. Worrying is living a what-if life, and thus far we're fine. And it was shortly after this that she had her stroke symptoms. Well, she has um, problems in her reproductive organs and tissues. She has endocrine system damage. That's what thyroiditis is. And um, it sounds like she has heart or brain problems. So that poor woman has a pretty heavy exposure. I doubt she'll have another child, be able to have another child. But the uh, in May of 2011, uh, two or three months after, after Fukushima, is when the highest levels of radiation were released. That was the peak. And um, that's exactly when she reported really being sick. Isn't that when she had the miscarriage? I don't know if it ever indicated. It happened sometime within the last two years. She said late spring of 2011, or you you read something that... Was when she had the stroke-like symptoms. That's when that, that peak release occurred, and Dr. Chris Busby, who's an international radiation expert, um, and he is also British, He was able to get air filters from cars in Japan, uh, in the Tokyo area uh, to Fukushima area, and he was able to calculate that the concentration of radionuclides in the atmosphere in northern Japan in um, April or May, it would have been about that time, was equivalent to 300 Chernobyls. So it doesn't matter how far you are away. You can't get away from this stuff. It moves around the world in air masses. It's carried by winds and ocean currents. And there's just no way, there's no way to hide. The whole planet is being impacted with this horrible poison. 
We have another singer from the UK. This is case number eight. Michelle Heaton is facing hospital misery when she revealed she's set to undergo a heart operation. The 33 year old singer needs surgery to determine if she'll need a pacemaker for her irregular heartbeat. And this appeared in the sun recently. Yeah, that's cesium uh, and, and damage to the mitochondria. There, the, um, the heart isn't firing properly at, at the right time. Case number nine is Stephen Patrick Morrissey. He's 54. He's the oldest one so far in our collection here. Also known as Morrissey, is an English singer and lyricist. He has been on tour uh, flying between the U.S. and the U.K. He was recently hospitalized with pneumonia in both lungs. The former Sims frontman who suffered a string of health problems in recent months, including a bleeding ulcer, a throat condition, and anemia, was forced to cancel a show in San Francisco on Saturday due to the potentially life-threatening condition. However, Morrissey, who only returned to the stage last month after axing a string of U.S. states because of his health woes, is hopeful to be well enough to perform in Mexico on Thursday. The story was updated yesterday that he has been forced to pull the plug on his tour because his spiraling medical costs and health scares make him uninsurable. He shouldn't be doing that anyway. He's a very sick man. He's got the bleeding ulcer. Here we go with the gastrointestinal thing. See, the, a lot of ulcers are caused by bacteria in the stomach, and he's got this problem with uh, pneumonia in both of his lungs, so he's got immune system damage. Now, there's That's... been a couple other famous people who've had to cancel concerts recently for medical reasons. Rihanna had to cancel a concert in Boston about 10 days ago. Elton John had canceled a concert recently as well for undisclosed medical reasons. And ABC News actually wondered about all these concert cancellations, including Justin Bieber, then Rihanna, and now Elton John. They said apparently concert cancellations are in the air. This appeared in the entertainment section of NBC News. It's the second anniversary of Fukushima. It's just a cascade of illness now. It's just going to get worse every month, every year. It's irreversible. Now, People now, need need to do everything they can to boost their immune systems. Don't eat processed food. Justin eat. Bieber, who is 19 collapsed on stage from shortness of breath during a performance in London on Thursday night. This was about a week ago. Representatives for the Canadian teen pop star said that he was heading to the doctor. He fainted and took a 20-minute reprieve and was given oxygen. Against his doctor's advice, he returned to the stage after the break to finish the show. He's very light of breath. The whole sh show he has been complaining, said his manager, and the following day, he actually got into an altercation and tried to assault a photographer. And it's another thing that we know radiation will also cause very aggressive behavior in people that have been exposed. And that was uh, widely documented in animals around the Chernobyl disaster. We had hogs attacking cars and other cases that were reported. Yeah, the, the radiation damages the executive part of the brain. In other words, it damages the impulse control mechanism that the brain has to keep us from doing really crazy things and that, that may be an impulse. And uh, in studies done all over the world uh, during bomb testing, the bomb testing era, there's a peer-reviewed published scientific paper on um, murders and terrorist acts and uh, violence reported in young men all over the world, cities all over the world, and it almost always correlated, these episodes correlated with a, a particular bomb test. So um, the radiation definitely damages the brain 
and the proper function of the brain, which is to um, to um, keep our lives running smoothly, basically. You found an article about today's opera singers getting ill too easily because they're weak, says a Covent Garden boss. The music director of the Royal Opera House has launched an astonishing attack on modern-day opera singers by claiming they are weaker in body and likely to pull out of shows. So here they're being criticized because they're sick. They always blame the victim. Lauren, can you um, talk about some stories that you've been following, too, about people who work in the airline industry? There's been some strange things that have happened to flight crews and pilots since Fukushima happened. Yes. Very early on, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty uh, verification sites, monitoring sites, stations that are all over the world, reported that the entire air column, this is from the surface of the ground up into uh, lower orbital space, is was contaminated with radiation from Fukushima. And that was, that was just uh, a month or two after Fukushima occurred. And then not very long after that, um, flight crews on Alaska Airlines were complaining, and they still are, of nosebleeds and strange rashes and um, other illnesses that were hard to explain, uh, Not just not feeling good. Hair, oh, their hair was falling out. And uh, just uh, not very long ago, a couple months ago, in early 2013, uh, two pilots for Alaska Airlines just passed out flying the plane. They, Of course, they had a co-pilot to take over, but uh, that's pretty unprecedented for a pilot to just pass out while he's flying the plane in mid-flight. And um, so that that I've been warning people not to fly across the Pacific Ocean. It's better to fly south into Mexico or South America and then go across the, the South Pacific, uh, south of the equator. And some people have been following my advice and doing it. And um, I know I take my Geiger counter on the airplane. Everybody today needs to have a Geiger counter they carry everywhere with them. Uh, you just have no idea where where the radiation is and if you have a Geiger counter you can leave that area. If you don't know you're just going to be staying there and and you become exposed. Um, in the last six months I live in Berkeley, California. I have been re reading the um, the student newspaper for UC Berkeley, the University of California at Berkeley. And beginning in about October, I noticed that uh, almost every week in the student newspaper, there was a front page obituary on a student just who just dropped dead uh, with no explanation. These are new graduates or students who have not graduated yet. I have a master's degree from Berkeley. I can't ever remember even reading an obituary on the front page of any student newspaper and until now and one of the uh, one of the ones that I knew was was caused by radiation exposure to the the Fukushima disaster was about two months ago in early twenty thirteen when a young woman student, an athlete, just dropped dead with no explanation. And she had gone for the summer to Hawaii to do her sport. And also she had done, the, the uh, article mentioned she'd done a lot of surfing there while she was there. Well, uh, when I was collecting the data from these comprehensive test ban treaty stations all over the world, 
they were reporting that the radiation levels, especially the radioactive iodine levels measured in Hawaii were as high as they were in Japan where the disaster occurred. So this poor young woman unwittingly went to Hawaii and um, unfortunately she was in radioactive paradise, but um, she certainly did pay for it with her life. So um, young people who are dying, it's, it's even more upsetting. At least uh, an older person has had their life, they've had their children. Um, it just seems like the young people are being turned into to radioactive fodder. I can't imagine this ever happening in, in world history. And Hawaii already had contamination problems from some of the testing that was done in the Pacific. Is that correct? Well, uh, when I went to Hawaii in 2007, I wanted to get a depleted uranium bill in the state legislature to, um, to help the sick veterans coming back. And... I went all over Hawaii, and no one even knew there was any radioactive contamination in Hawaii. And I went on ABC TV uh, and did a a two-and-a-half-minute news story because I had gone to Kona on the big island of Hawaii and measured uh, high levels of uh, radiation on a day that they were firing, they were doing live firing at uh, Pohakaloa Army Base, which has been a bombing and gunnery range uh, since World War II. Some activists claim the U.S. Army is firing depleted uranium on gunnery ranges in Hawaii, contaminating the state with radioactive fallout. They recently took Geiger counter readings downwind from Pohakuloa on the Big Island. KITV's Dick Allgaier joins us live now with details. Dick? Hi, Jill. The U.S. Army, of course, says it does not use depleted uranium rounds when it practices in Hawaii. But one activist says she took high radiation readings, which may indicate depleted uranium, recently on the Big Island. In order to protect the nuclear... Lorraine Moray is a world-renowned expert on the subject of depleted uranium. She travels the globe giving presentations about the dangers of spreading nanoparticles of radioactive uranium through bombs and bullets. It's not harmless. It's extremely toxic. It on April 22nd, she took Geiger counter readings in South Kona on the Big Island. 63. <laughs> This is very, very alarming. Normal background radiation would be 5 to 20 counts per minute. On this day, she says she took readings of up to 93, which experts say is abnormal and quite high. That is horrendous. And it could only be because they were doing live fire with depleted uranium at Pohakaloa while we were doing the measurements. Lorraine Murray claims the Army is using depleted uranium on the Pohakuloa firing range and the wind is blowing radiation over South Kona. The Army insists it does not use depleted uranium in Hawaii. Dr. Lauren Pang is a public health official in Hawaii. In this interview, he says he is speaking only as a concerned physician. Regardless of what it is, from, it is high. It has to be looked at. Now, furthermore, she, you know, she, she, she went around the training area, and I guess it was high downwind of the firing range, which is kind of like a smoking gun. All of the bombing and gunnery ranges are contaminated in Hawaii with depleted uranium already. Now, there has been a bill at the legislature that would require testing for depleted uranium near targets at Schofield Barracks. The Army would not comment on that. Again, the Army and National Guard have said DU is not used in Hawaii. Reporting from the newsroom, Dick Allgaier, KITV4, Island Television News. And um, there, the day I drove through the base, you have to drive through the base to get from one side of the island to the other between the volcanoes. And, um, and then I went 35 miles south down the coast to a macadamia farm, and I said, gee, let's get a video camera just in case 
we measure some radiation because we'd organized um, a radiation monitoring citizens posse. And I had people going all over the island measuring the radiation. We'd go off in cars, six or eight or 12 cars, and um, do it together sometimes. So I ended up down on this macadamia farm. We would bought a, a video camera on the way and some film. And um, so we're standing there on the deck looking out at the ocean and listening to the whales. And I said, gee, I'll, I'll flip my my." Uh, Geiger counter on now and I almost dropped it because it went up to uh, as high as 90 over 90 counts per minute uh, and usually it's about 7 and I uh, just about had a heart attack so um, we filmed it and I called uh, Dick Allgaier who is a uh, uh, radio I mean, a TV anchor at ABC TV in Honolulu, and he'd heard me on the Jeff Rents program, and he said, if you ever come to Hawaii, I'll do a story on you. So I said, Dick, I'm in in Kona, and this is what I got today. And he said, did you film it? And I said, yes. He said, get on a plane and come over right now. Well, all of of the Hawaiian islands are completely radioactive from, uh, simulated nuclear bomb testing on uh, different islands, on uh, nuclear rockets they were launching from one of the islands. Um, They were shooting um, the, let's see, it's called the Davy Crockett. It's actually a mini nuke. It's a shoulder nuke. But they used uh, depleted uranium in it instead of actual nuclear weapons because you don't want to shoot nuclear weapons uh, where you live and uh, off the battlefield. And so all of uh, Oahu, which is where Honolulu is, is contaminated on bombing and gunnery ranges. And uh, all along uh, Pearl Harbor's a nuclear sewer um, and the whole beaches and the and the coastal uh currents go carry it past Honolulu and Waikiki and Diamond Head so that very very expensive area of Hawaii is all contaminated with radiation well and now they will have um problems with the ocean releases from Fukushima which when I interviewed uh, Dr. Christopher Busby in June of 2012, he indicated to me that the contamination from Fukushima had already reached the beaches. Oh, That's yeah. not to be confused with the tsunami debris field, which is traveling north of there, and once it hits the west coast of Canada and the U.S., it will curve back around and eventually end up in Hawaii as well. Hawaii is going to have some big problems, and some of that is already showing in their coral They have fish and turtles that are exhibiting lesions, and I've had reports from people that live there and do a lot of scuba diving that the reefs are in big trouble. That's the Fukushima radiation, and um, it's, of course, as I've mentioned, radiation has a cumulative effect, effect. and uh, I noticed when I was going to the Hawaiian legislature every day on buses to, uh, I was staying in Waikiki, and I was noticing on the buses every day going back and forth uh, that it was the sickest population I've ever seen anywhere. People were pushing uh, adult children with uh, completely neuromuscular problems. They couldn't even walk. Uh, there were people getting on dragging air oxygen tanks everybody was walking with canes and uh it was just horrible to see that and i said what in the world happened here well i figured it out finally the um u.s and britain did nuclear weapons tests and biological tests and chemical tests with different weapons on Johnson Island and Christmas Island that um, it, they're less than a 1,000 miles upwind to the west from Hawaii. 
So Hawaii was getting nuked, and it was mixed with biological agents and chemicals, and that's why so many people are sick in Hawaii already. This new exposure to Fukushima is going to have a devastating effect on the existing Hawaiian population. And quite frankly, anyone who goes to Hawaii as a tourist or for any reason is committing suicide. Before Fukushima, in fact, decades before Fukushima, some of the greatest actors and actresses and performers of our time may have died because of their exposure to atmospheric testing or their proximity to the Rocketdyne plant. And as one example will show, this even extends to their children. One of the most famous and talked about examples of this is the movie The Conqueror, which was a 1956 film produced by Howard Hughes, starring John Wayne as the Mongol conqueror Genghis Khan. Other performers included Susan Hayward, Agnes Moorhead, and Pedro Armendariz. The picture was directed by actor and director Dick Powell, and the film was principally shot near St. George, Utah. There was a huge cancer controversy following this film. The exterior scenes were shot on location near St. George, which was 137 miles downwind of the United States government's Nevada test site. In 1953, extensive above-ground nuclear weapons testing occurred at the test site as part of Operation Upshot Knothole. The cast and crew spent many difficult weeks on location, and in addition, Hughes later shipped 60 tons of radioactive dirt back to Hollywood to reshoot scenes. The filmmakers knew about the nuclear tests, and there were publicity photographs of Wayne holding a Geiger counter during production, but the link between the exposure to radioactive fallout and cancer was poorly understood then. Now, Powell died of cancer in January of 1963, only a few years after the picture's completion. Pedro Armadiras was diagnosed with kidney cancer in 1960, and he committed suicide in 63 when he learned it was terminal. Hayward, Wayne, and Moorhead all died of cancer in the mid to late 1970s. Cast member John Hoyt died of lung cancer in 1991. The skeptics had also pointed to other factors, such as the wide use of tobacco. Of course, there we get into a multiplier effect and the notion that cancer resulting from radiation exposure does not have such a long incubation period. The cast and crew totaled 220 people. By 1981, 91 of them had developed some form of cancer, and 46 had died. Dr. Robert Pendleton, professor of biology at the University of Utah, stated with these numbers, this case could only qualify as an epidemic. The connection between fallout radiation and cancer in individual cases has been practically impossible to prove conclusively, but in a group this size, you'd only expect some 30 cancers to develop. I think the tie-in to their exposure on the set of The Conqueror would hold up in a court of law. Absolutely it would, except that radiation... Uh, Lawsuits are very, very, very difficult to prove. Um, One person, Dr. Chris Busby, has won almost every, I think he's won every lawsuit that he was an expert witness in. And uh, he was able to do it because he's British, he's not American. He was an expert witness here in the U.S. on the Simi Valley uh, nuclear disaster in uh, North in Los Angeles, and uh, he won that lawsuit. Rocketdyne had a facility there in Simi Valley, uh, which is in the no- northern part of LA, and um, they were operating a an, ex- a an experimental or a research reactor. Uh, because they were developing X-ray lasers for space weapons. Now, um, he uh, went to Los Angeles for the law firm representing 
uh, maybe 35 or 40 children, the parents had filed this lawsuit, uh, who had extremely rare cancers or died of very rare cancers. And uh, the parents wanted to, they knew it was rocket dying. They wanted, you know, they wanted their day in court. And Chris uh, finally tested the groundwater and discovered that there were very fresh, very short half-life fission products in the groundwater, the drinking water, which means that the reactor had to be operational at the time that he took the the samples because some of the short half-lives are hours or minutes or days, uh, whatever. And um, when he got the results back, and, and there were fish and fresh fish and products in, in, the, in the groundwater, he went straight to the law firm and gave them the data and explained what it meant, interpreted it for them. They took it to the, uh, uh, the defendant's law firm, the one representing Rocketdyne, and Rocketdyne immediately quietly settled out of court. They didn't want a court. Uh, judgment or a precedent set, and they paid uh, $250 million to those plaintiffs. Uh, Nobody's ever heard of that out of court because every single person in Los Angeles has been exposed to Rocketdyne uh, fission products, and everyone in L.A. could sue Rocketdyne if they knew. So um, that had two meltdowns. There was one in 1963 and uh, an earlier one, I believe it was 1957. And I believe that 1957 was the first meltdown in the United States of a nuclear reactor. Yes, and the one that happened a few years later that I, I found in an interview with a former worker At the site, she indicated that the second incident, they had lost 80% of the cladding on the fuel rods during that meltdown, and no one was ever even told about that accident. I know. I I know a woman who um, is a secretary for G. Edward Griffin, who is, um, he writes books, uh, he wrote The the Creature of Jekyll Island on, on the Federal Reserve. And she contacted me because she said, I have cancer of the eye, and I used to jog on the, um, the public pathways around the Santa Susana site that Rocketdyne was, where they were operating this uh, reactor, research reactor. And I said, well, you were exposed to fission products while you were out there jogging. And um, I don't know whether she's completely lost her eye yet or not, but she's still trying to file a lawsuit. Now, so I I put her in touch with uh, Dr. Busby. But what Busby told me is that that reactor, all reactors in the United States have to be licensed by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the... um, uh, the pre- predecessor was the Atomic Energy Commission. It's now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And you can't operate a nuclear reactor in the United States without an NRC license to operate. That, the NRC had revoked the Rocketdyne license to operate that reactor 10 years before he took that water sample and discovered the fission products in it. So they were not only operating a nuclear reactor in a heavily populated urban area, but they were also illegally operating a nuclear reactor for 10 years, and they were never caught. Now, didn't you say that, was it, is it Michael Landon uh, bought some of that property and was making films there? Yes, he bought the property adjacent to there, and there's been comments from people on blogs that knew some of the uh, actresses that were in Little House on the Prairie, Bonanza, 
um, was filmed, filmed in the series. There's been a number of films. Um, Men in Black had filmed a scene there. But Little House on, on the Prairie had been there for quite a while, and, and people who worked on that cast reported that there were a large number of people that also came down with illnesses, but that had not been publicized. This is just comments on blogs from people that know the actors and actresses that worked on Little House on the Prairie. Michael Landon himself died of pancreatic cancer. This appeared in January 13th of 2009 in Mental Floss. In 1991, Michael Landon was hospitalized for what he thought might be an ulcer. Sadly, medical tests revealed cancerous tumors in both his liver and pancreas. Landon had been a heavy drinker and smoker throughout his life. Multiplier effect. So although the diagnosis was shocking, it wasn't totally unexpected. However, several years after Little House had stopped filming, many crew members were also diagnosed with rare forms of cancer. Little House on the Prairie had been filmed on the Paramount Movie Ranch near Chatsworth, California. Recent studies have turned up previously suppressed reports that the entire Simi Valley area was exposed to what has been labeled the worst environmental release of radioactivity ever in the United States courtesy of an experimental sodium-cooled nuclear reactor operated at the time by Rocketdyne Corporation. Uh, actor Patrick Swayze, who also grew up in the Simi Valley area, it says currently suffers from pancreatic cancer. He's now passed away. And Motley Crue singer Vince Neal, who lived in Chatsworth for many years, lost his four-year-old daughter to a rare form of stomach cancer. They're not the only Hollywood celebrities who were exposed. There, um, there were atomic veterans, Steve McQueen was one of them, who were sent out to the Nevada test site by the thousands, and uh, they were put in, in fox trenches or just they just sat on the ground uh, a thousand feet from the nuclear bomb explosion, the test site. And um, they, they were just, they had to sit there when the nuclear bomb went off and have all this radioactive debris fall down on them. And, of course, Steve McQueen died of leukemia. Um, even Canada sent a number of uh, atomic veterans or, or their own soldiers, personnel, to the Nevada test site to be exposed to nuclear bomb tests. I... I there's just no morality at all with nuclear materials. There's no morality at all. It's definitely uh, being used to depopulate uh, large numbers of, of population and uh, certain targeted groups. And, of course, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of England, owns the mineral rights to the entire Commonwealth. That's every country, 27 countries in the Commonwealth. Uh, when you buy land there, you're only buying the top 12 inches of dirt. She owns everything below the top 12 inches of from the surface. And she owns most of the, um, the uranium mines in the world. She certainly owns a very, very large percentage. So who is benefiting from this nuclear nightmare? Uh, that money's going straight into Queen Elizabeth's pocket. I think she's one of the most evil people on this planet. Um, I just brought up an article about Patrick Swayze, too. He died at the age of 57. He was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer or intraductal papillary muconous neoplasm which metastasized to his stomach and liver. He was very secretive about how severe the cancer was. He died two years after his diagnosis, and that's something that I keep seeing reoccur to in these cases that may be linked to nuclear fallout. People suffer from very, very aggressive forms of yeah. cancer in multiple, many times multiple organs. I believe John Wayne had it in his stomach and esophagus. He, he had it in several well, see, that's immune system damage because everyone has cancer in their bodies. It's a healthy immune system that suppresses the cancer um, so that it cannot lose its uh, growth control mechanism. 
and um, there it is. It's, it's damage to the immune system. But what I've been noticing is that in older people, as compared to these younger celebrities we discussed earlier, the older people are dying from heart attacks, from heart disease. Elizabeth Taylor died from heart disease. She, she shouldn't have died of heart disease. She was exposed to all kinds of radiation in Los Angeles from bomb testing in the nuclear power plants and, and the depleted uranium and fission products from Iraq and Afghanistan. No wonder she died from heart, heart disease. And then um, other uh, celebrities, older celebrities, these are in their 60s and 70s. A lot of them have pancreatic cancer or uh, mostly pancreatic cancer. And that is probably damage to the endocrine system, the thyroid pituitary adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland is right above the pancreas. But it could also be immune system damage, but why does it keep happening in the pancreas? I think it's probably related to endocrine damage. Now, comparing the thyroiditis increase uh, caused by Fukushima to the Chernobyl rate and occurrence incidence of thyroiditis, um, the Chernobyl exposures in Belarus and, and uh, around the, the Chernobyl plant, the immediate vicinity, um, thyroiditis didn't uh, express itself until three or four years after Chernobyl. This is a much more acute exposure, even though we're an ocean away from Japan on the west coast of North America or the whole, all of North America, because the, uh, I've talked to six people now with thyroiditis. One was a woman, and the rest are men. All of them except one were under the age of 50. And uh, they reported uh, the symptoms of thyroiditis occurred, they noticed, within six to nine months after Fukushima. So this is uh, at least five times faster, seven times faster than um, more rapid onset than, than the people exposed locally to Chernobyl. So we have had a very, very serious uh, global exposure, uh, but much worse in the Northern Hemisphere, although now it's being reported, radiation is being reported off of Australia. Uh, I have a friend in Australia on the, um, near, near the west, southwest coast of Australia, and she told me her hair is falling out. She said the radiation levels um, along the beaches are much higher over the past four or five months. So the radiation from Fukushima is moving around the Pacific, and it's now below the equator. And it's continuing because there, there's been nothing done to contain the releases, and we have broken fuel from the explosions that's laying all over the countryside there. Isn't there a continuous release of iodine from that broken fuel as well? Well, there's, we don't know, I don't know, because there's no data that's being officially released, so I don't know what they're measuring, but um, they're still having daily problems with the reactors, with the spent fuel pools, and of course, uh, these releases into the atmosphere and into the, the groundwater and into the ocean are not going to end in our lifetime, Christina. Um, this is going to be centuries of, of uh, radionuclides escaping from that disaster. And since the Stuxnet virus was deliberately put into the operating system to sabotage the backup um, electrical generators, that was not an accident. The voltage in the generators was the wrong voltage for the reactors 
that couldn't have been an accident. Um, these reactors were built to withstand uh, nothing higher than a magnitude 7 earthquake when Japan has a magnitude 8.5 earthquake every five years. The island of Japan, the island arc of Japan, is sitting on top of four colliding tectonic plates. It's one of the most prone, major earthquake prone uh, countries in the world. Why in the world would you put nuclear reactors there? None of this is an accident. One of the uh, saddest stories that I came across, this was in an L.A. Times article from 1999, was the lead singer of Motley Crue had sued Boeing, North America, who now owns the Rocketdyne plant, claiming that his daughter's death by cancer in 1995 was caused by radioactive material dumped in the ground and groundwater near his former home near the Santa Susana Field Laboratory. Vince Neal and his ex-wife, Cherise, bought a home in Chatsworth in 1991, a few miles east of Boeing's division. Boeing acquired the property in 1996 when it bought Rockwell International's aerospace and defense business. The suit claimed that Boeing, Rockwell, and Rocketdyne knowingly dumped hazardous materials such as plutonium and uranium near the Neal's Summit Ridge Circle residence southeast of Simi Valley. Their four-year-old daughter, Skylar, was diagnosed with a rare form of stomach cancer in April 1995 and died four months later. The suit claims that her death came as a direct result of the activities conducted by defendants. His Beverly Hills attorney, David Cordry, said the singer only recently learned about toxic contamination at the Santa Susana Field Laboratory after a Rocketdyne worker health study was released by UCLA researchers in April. April of what year? April of 2000 and, I'm sorry, 1999. Yeah, it was before um, Dr. Busby did his work there. And if he had had um, Dr. Busby on, on his lawsuit or if he'd been able to join Busby's law, the, the lawsuit that Busby was involved in, he would have won. But you can't, you can't face a huge force like the nuclear in industry and the military with vested interest in protecting the nuclear weapons program and, and nuclear reactor program, uh, you cannot face that and win as a single uh, plaintiff. You have to be a part of a really big group, a lot of people. And there have been very, very few lawsuits that have been won in the United States for radiation exposure. He was interviewed a few years later where he indicated there was a problem with the statute of limitations on the lawsuit, so he had to give up on it. Yeah, that's, it was the statute of limitations to protect the corporation. And do you know who the, um, the security company is at the, um, the nuclear power plants, but especially at the... Um, nuclear weapons laboratories. It's Wackenhut. Wackenhut is the security company that assassinated Karen Silkwood. And the uh, director of the Los Alamos nuclear weapons lab when Karen Silkwood was murdered was uh, Dr. McGee from the Kerr-McGee family who owned the uh, the Kermagee facility where Karen Silkwood was working. So you can see that all these interests are all intertwined. It's a it's a uh, it's a web of death and, and deceit and um, uh, greed. Uh, Wackenhut is owned partly owned by Barbara Bush. And I remember reading about George W. Bush and Jeb Bush hanging out all the time at a, a Wacken Hut facility in Florida that's uh, like a country club. Well, then I learned later 
that the reason they were hanging out there all the time is because their mother owned it. <laughs> so what, you know, what aren't they involved in? They have their fingers in every nuclear pie because it's profitable. So it sounds like Vince Neal was right about what he thought, blaming it on this plant. And he was asked in this magazine interview, wasn't there a nuclear meltdown at Rocketdyne in 1959? And he answered, yeah. So we had them dead to rights. If it was privately owned, that would be a different thing, but it's a government thing, and they're wrong. Of course, I asked the doctors, why did Schuyler get cancer? Obviously, they don't blanking no. But you hear these reports, oh, it's the smoking, it's the food you eat, it's this, it's that. You're effing four years old. You're not exposed to that much yet. Give me a break. It's weird because she went through six operations and they actually cut the cancer out of her. It weighed like four pounds. You only weigh 30 pounds when you're four. It's like most of your body. They took me down to pathology. They actually showed me her cancer. I was like, I've got to see what's killing my daughter. It looked like evil. It was black. That's what pure evil looks like, and that's what was on that effing table. There were lots of people that lived there and got out. I sued not only the government, but the developers that sold the house and developed the community. Obviously, they effing knew. You've got to disclose that. If you've got to disclose if there's effing ghosts in your house, you've got to disclose that you're living in a crap neighborhood, even though it was multi-million dollar homes. He goes on to say it's like the NASA space program. It's run by Boeing, who now owns Rocketdyne, but Boeing is contracted through the U.S. government to run the tests. They said they cleaned up that basin down there. They said they took out like a foot of dirt, then sealed it and carted it away. But it's been there since the effing 50s. It's not a foot down. It's 40 and 50 feet down. You can't fight City Hall. There's another a-hole of the fucking month. Oops. <laughs> There's... <laughs> There's another a-hole of the effing month, the U.S. government. <laughs> I wish you'd leave that in. <laughs> I can leave it in. Hey, that's real life. That's what how people feel about this stuff. What can we do? We, we... Well, they, they should feel that way. Uh, let me tell you what um, Meryl Eisenbud said at a... AEC, Atomic uh, Energy Commission meeting in New York City. This was in the, fi in the 50s. Uh, he said this was discussing um, the nuclear bomb test and in, um, let's see, uh, Bikini Atoll and the, the ones in the Pacific. And he said, well, um, these Pacific Islanders, are not exactly like us. They're more like the mice. But um, it's okay to to bomb them with with nuclear weapons because um, they're they're not really human. <laughs> it was so horrible. It was so blatant. And basically, they just think we're all mice. We're lab rats for them to experiment on. Someone, someone from the AEC said when they found out about John Wayne, they said, oh, my God, don't tell me we killed John Wayne. Yeah. Because they knew they had detonated 11 tests there the year before they filmed this movie on the site. Yeah. And the, those are called the radioactive spaghetti westerns. And uh, Howard Hughes absolutely knew because he refused to ever go to Nevada uh, when they were doing bomb tests. He absolutely refused to go to Nevada. He wouldn't go anywhere near the bomb test. He knew. Loren, what can people do who have to fly for work? What precautions can you recommend to people or anyone who might live in an area around one of these facilities? And we, there's lots of facilities around the United States. You mentioned them at the beginning of the broadcast, um, Pentax and Idaho and um, Tennessee I, Valley. Yeah. I, I think the most important thing is for people to have um, personal Geiger counters or dosimeters 
so that when you hear that going off, you can it, it's alerting you that you're being exposed to radiation, and you can leave the area or refuse to fly or whatever you need to do to escape. Um, I don't believe anybody anymore uh, working for the government or any <laughs> any institution uh, that is supposed to be protecting your health and the environment. The Atomic Energy Commission and the military set up the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and that was to, um, to protect the government and the military's uh, nuclear weapons testing program and to hide the harm uh, from the citizens of America. The, they also set up the U.S. military and the Atomic Energy Commission then went on to set up the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute to protect the government and the military's programs. And they also sent up the Centers for Disease Control. So all of the agencies, government official agencies, that American citizens think are there to protect them, it's absolutely the opposite. So um, another thing to avoid is the x-ray machines in the airports. Whatever you do, don't go through those. Ask for a pat-down. Uh, I've done it many times, and uh, the TSA uh, agents, personnel have been very courteous, and I didn't have any problems at all. I'm not going through any of those x-ray machines. I went through one. I was at the Tokyo airport. I was on my way back to the U.S. from Malaysia from a war crimes conference there, and um, the this uh, agent came out, this older man came out and pulled me out of the line. I was waiting to check in and give them my bags. He said, come with me, and he took me somewhere, and um, uh, I was disoriented, and he just opened the door, and he shoved me backwards into uh, one of those x-ray machines and zapped me. And then when I came out, I had, uh, then I went through the security, and they found uh, a bag of film in my backpack which was in a protective lead bag and they said uh, can we take this and, and check it and I said okay and um, uh, I'm certain that they switched the film on me uh, every time I've gone through the Tokyo airport documents have disappeared from my bags from my backpack newspaper articles that uh, I was interviewed in different countries and uh, this has also happened to Alfred Weber, who's done a lot of interviews with me. So uh, it's all a web of deception, and uh, the, the citizens of the world are the real target, and they're just making a lot of money on us, making us sick and, and selling their uranium. Well, and it's part of control, too, isn't it? Because people who are sick can't really fight back. That's right, and um, and... Uh, Americans and, and people in North America, the Northern Hemisphere, are just going to die from long, lingering illnesses. Um, like I mentioned before in the last interview, Chase Bank owns CVS uh, Pharmacy. Uh, the bankers are buying the pharmaceutical companies and the drug stores, and they're, uh, they're putting drive-through windows in these pharmaceutical in these pharmacies so that they can make even more money because they're illegally selling drugs also without prescriptions. The saying, the canary in a coal mine, is an allusion to caged canaries that mining workers would carry down into the tunnels with them. And if dangerous gases such as methane or carbon monoxide leaked into the mine shaft, the gases would kill the canary before it killed the miners. In regards to someone whose sensitivity to adverse conditions makes it a useful early indicator of such conditions, something which warns of the coming of greater danger or trouble by a deterioration in its health or welfare. 
I want to recommend the Gamma Scout Geiger counter from Germany. It's excellent. And everyone should have one of those. They come with a 12-year battery. They're excellent Geiger counters. Um, you asked, you know, how can we protect ourselves? Well, that's one of the best ways. It's to actually measure the radiation. You can trust that. I, I wouldn't trust any government or uh, agency or health department. Um, I think they're all terrorist organizations. Many of the nuclear workers that I've talked to who have since retired from the industry have told me the same thing. Whatever you do, do not trust your government to Absolutely. tell you things are okay. No, they're not. That's right. We're on our own. You have to take responsibility for your life, for your family, for your children, and you have to educate yourself uh, in order to be able to protect yourself. The government isn't protecting us. We're in this mess because of the government. Lorena, thank you so much for joining me today in this discussion. I know six celebrities aren't something either one of us usually discuss, but I think um, we could definitely use some help gathering information. If you guys come across any articles that pertain to this discussion that we had today, please email them to me at christinax4 at yahoo.com. We will also be accepting mutation images. Um, Lauren, you are probably most renowned for your work and research related to depleted uranium as a weapon of war and genocide, and it would be wonderful to have you back to discuss that and other nuclear crimes against populations in more detail, including the 70,000 U.S. servicemen and women who provided relief efforts to the people of Japan after the 9.0 earthquake, of which many of them now are now coming down with serious illnesses, cancer, birth defects, and other issues, and they have started their own lawsuit against TEPCO. And we can also continue collecting the sudden cardiac death um, articles, too, because I have a few of those as well. Yes, and I'd, I'd like to encourage um, the listening audience to our listeners to uh, send images. Uh, you can email them to Christina or to me um, of mutations. Uh, please pass these interviews around to your family, your friends, uh, post them, put them on Facebook, but circulate this information, please, because the more people are educated about this and the more aware they are, the more difficult it is for the ruling elite to go on with these insane uh, eugenics and depopulation programs. The canary in the coal mine is our babies and our children. That's another form of, of monitoring the radiation. And I know that grandmothers and mothers today know there's something terribly wrong and they know it's environmental because the children and the babies are not thriving. It's, uh, it's going to take many people, and I know we can do it, but I think we need to, to turn off radiation, ionizing radiation. Radiation respects no borders, no socioeconomic group, and no religion. I've also had a number of people contact me since our last interview saying that they have noticed an increase in babies with birth defects in their areas um, in the DMV while they're waiting, um, you know, just in places where they're in public where they see people they wouldn't normally come across. After that interview, I had a bunch of emails from people saying, you know what, I am noticing that. And when you know what to look for, you do see it everywhere. And it's like having eyes all over when you share these stories with us, too, because we can use it to gather more information and do more shows and help make people aware of what's going on and how we can protect ourselves. We will really look forward to speaking with you again, Loren. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Christina. Nuked Radio airs Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on UCY-TV. 
Check out our archive of 100 past shows, including the two-year anniversary interview that I did with Loren. It's on FukushimaFacts.com and on YouTube. Please share love, caring, and concern for your fellow man, and together we can find answers of how to stop getting nuked. Stay safe, everyone.